when I was a kid? I wanted to be a superhero. I wanted to be able to fly, climb buildings. I wanted to read people's minds. I had all the accessories. I had a cape, I had some wings. I even carried around a magic wand just in case that would help. I remember standing on the garden wall at my parents' house and wishing I could fly. And I'd jump off, and as I'd jump, I'd wish so hard that I was flying. And I'd open my eyes, and I'd look down, and I'd still be on the ground. So I did some research, some real research. Okay, so I read lots of comic books, but it's the same thing. And I realized that actually, I hadn't been born on a different planet. I'd never been bitten by a mutant spider, and actually, I hadn't been exposed to extreme radiation. So I needed to think of a new way, as a mere mortal, that I was going to become a superhero. And so I'd follow Batman, right? He used his brain to come up with cool devices for superpowers. So as a kid, I was that kid who loved science, and I loved maths. And I also loved taking things apart. My parents called it breaking stuff, I called it learning about stuff. They'd come home, and I'd be like, hey, Dad, I know how the toast is brown. And he's like, really? I was like, yeah, it's got these elements in the toaster. We didn't have toast in our family for a long time because the toaster was in pieces, and the video recorder, and the laptop, and the computer. But I called it learning, he called it breaking. So I had to decide at some point, what was I going to do with my life? Sat down with a careers advisor, and she's like, Michelle, academically, I have a list for you of the perfect jobs. I was like, okay. She's like, number one, you should be a medical doctor. Right, I said, academically, that might be where I'm suited, but I don't like people <laughs> at all. Not sure that's the ideal dream job for me. She's like, it's okay, I have a list. And on your list, she read them out to me. Nutritionist, pediatrician, dentist, all have got people in, not interested. I peered at the bottom of the list and wondered if superhero was actually a valid career option. It wasn't. She shook her head at me and said, look, I've gone through my list and you just don't know what you want to do. You need to sit down and think of the three things that you're excited about. I'm like, that's easy. I like jumping. I like jumping off things. I've jumped off things since I was a kid. Jumping. I like climbing. I like to rock climb, climb lots of different things around things. And, um, and I like breaking things. I call it taking them apart, but my dad calls it breaking things. So I wondered if there was a job that I could do that involved all of these three. <laughs> I walked to that office, very disheartened as she shook her head at me. So I was like, do you know what, actually, I'm going to fire my own path. I'm going to go to university, and I'm going to walk around, and I'm just going to be inspired by university and all of that intelligence there, and I'll figure out what I want to do. So I did. I walked around aimlessly, found myself in an engineering department, went down to the basement, and I saw this sign. The sign said, Fracture Mechanics Lab. Oh, I thought, Fracture Mechanics. I wonder what that is. So I peered through the door, and inside were machines, big machines. Not normal machines, but machines with dials and flashy lights and buttons. And I was like, yeah, this is what I want to do. <laughs> so I walked in, and I was like, what are you guys doing here? And he's like, fracture mechanics. It says on the door. I'm like, no, I can read the sign. I just don't know what that means. And he's like, oh, we break stuff. <laughs> yeah? I'm like, what sort of stuff? He's like, we break everything. I was like, uh-huh. I'm like, do you ever have to put it back together? He was like, never. I'm like, sign me up. <laughs> Four years of my life in engineering school, and I loved every second of it. Now, while I was in engineering school, a book came out. This book may have changed my life. It's called Prey by Michael Crichton. If you've read it, you'll know how awesome it is. It's about nanobots, and they take over the world by infecting your brain. And Yeah, OK, so it's a bit of a horror sci-fi thing. But I was like, nanobots, yeah, they must be like robots, but nano-ish. I have no idea what the word nano means. I need to go look this up. So I did. And I learned that as technical as nano sounds, it just means really, really small. How small? Well, 10 to the power of nine is nine of a meter small, right? Makes sense? No, most people blank me at that. So I try and explain it a different way. I'm like, you know, like 0 0.000001 of a meter. Clearer? No? Let's do this experiment. Take a strand of hair. If you don't have any hair, just pluck one off the person in front of you. They won't mind, it's the science. When you look at how wide your hair is, I can tell you that it's 80,000 nanometers wide. What that means is you could put 80,000 nanobots on the width of your hair. That's really, really small. 
So here I am, sitting at university one day on my lunch break, reading through my book. It's probably the fifth time I'd read it. I loved it. One of the professors walked past me and turned up his nose. I was like, what? This book is awesome. It's about nanobots and how they're taking over people's minds and taking over the world. And he was like, uh-huh. I was like, could you imagine if we could make nanobots? He's like, we can. I'm like, no, 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 it's science fiction, you know, it's like fantasy, it's kind of like warp speed and the Vulcan death grip and cute little Spocky is. It's not real. And he was like, no, it's real, I can make nanobots. <laughs> I was like, what? He's like, I run a nanotechnology research group, I can make you nanobots. <laughs> I was like, okay, <laughs> let's go. He's like, actually, I have this new project right now where we're creating nano coatings that sit on top of anything and protect them. So right now we're designing them for smartphones. You can put this coating on a smartphone, you can put your phone in your pocket with your keys and it doesn't scratch. I was like, cool, so you made an invisible force field for phones. <laughs> he was like, whatever, no, we have a scientific name for it. I was like, yeah, but you just made an invisible cloak, right? He was like, all right. I was like, so do you need any help for this project? He's like, actually, I'm looking for somebody who's really good at breaking things. Because <laughs> what we need to know is how strong this, this coating is. I was like, you want me to break your invisible force field? <laughs> I'm in. And that changed my life. And here I am today, running New Zealand's first and only nanomechanical testing lab, where I make and I break really tiny things. So some of you are like, come on, Michelle, nanotechnology, it's so in the future. And I'm like, it's so now. You guys use nanotech every day in your life. We just don't tell you about it. You put sunscreen on recently. You know when you put the sunscreen on your nose and it's white? And then what you do is you rub it in. Have you noticed? It disappears, becomes invisible. <laughs> yeah, that's nanotech. What we do is inside your sunscreen, we have zinc oxide, and we make the particles of zinc oxide so tiny that they're nanoparticles. And then we put it in your sunscreen so that when you rub it on your face, you now have an invisible force field on your face protecting you from the sun. Those of you who are slightly older remember that sunscreen that you used to put on your face and you just have a white face, yeah? <laughs> have you noticed that it's changed recently? All we've done is made the particles smaller. They went from micro that you could see that were white to nano that you can't, and now you have invisibility. Huh. So in my lab, I don't make sunscreen, but I too take these zinc oxide um, particles and I can get them to self-assemble into wires and I can get these nanowires to grow into nanoflowers. I am a girl after all. <laughs> what we can do with that is we can make little microelectronic devices, we can make them have piezoelectric piezoelectricity and what we can do is create fibers that go in your clothing so that every time you move, you create a charge. What that means is you could put your MP3 player in your pocket and charge it while you're walking. Right, okay, now we're on to something. So I thought, if I'm in this nanotechnology field, I might as well go back to being a kid, right, and use it for my personal goals. I mean, maybe I could make myself fly, maybe I could read your mind, maybe I could have an invisible force field. Yeah, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna dedicate my life to real science, but secretly on the side, I'm gonna try and achieve some of these things. So I tried flying, I've tried doing lots of different things involving flying or airtime, I snow kite, I kite surf, I jump out of planes, okay? It's not quite what I was looking for though. So is there a way that I could fly using my science? Well, conductivity is just a measure of how well a material can transmit electricity. And it does that because you have little electrons carrying that charge throughout the material. Unfortunately, electrons have a mind of their own, which means that they dilly-dally all over the place and they bounce off atoms, and every time they bounce off an atom, you lose that energy as heat. Um, that's a good thing if you're a bird sitting on a wire because your feet are toasty warm. That is a bad thing if you own a power company and you're trying to get electricity to your city because all you're doing is you're keeping the birds warm, okay? You're losing a lot of that energy. So let me introduce you to the concept of a material called superconductors. And superconductors can transfer their electricity with zero electrical resistance, meaning that charge goes straight through and there's no bouncing. Pretty cool. What does that mean? We can make very thin wires with superconductors and we can take your energy from your power plant or renewable power source, pump it to your city thousands of kilometers away without actually losing any of that energy. Now that would be cool. However, there's a cooler thing about superconductors. Let me introduce you to a superconductor. It looks like this, it's a little disc. And if I chill this superconductor down to a temperature that's cold enough, I'm just gonna put some liquid nitrogen on here, it's gonna change its phase. 
Now, if I bring a magnet close to it, this is a little magnet, happens to be shaped like a ball cube, but that's purely for my entertainment. And I put it on top of my superconductor, you should be able to see that it just free floats in space. Got to make sure it's cold enough under these hot lights. And if I take this superconductor that is now free floating in space and I apply a little force to it, you should be able to see that it's levitating. And that is the art of levitation. Now, if I was a real engineer, I'd be talking about making frictionless bearings for engineering systems, but I know that superconductors can hold 70,000 times their weight, which means that I would only need a few of these discs stuck to the bottom of my shoes to be able to fly. I've just got to figure out how to make shoes that are cold enough that I can do this without freezing off my feet. But I'm getting there, I'm getting there, we're halfway there, okay. Now the next thing that I want to be able to do is read your mind, right? And our brains are full of these brain cells that talk to each other all the time. So my question is, how do they do that? Do they have to be attached to each other? Or they can, can they transmit that signal through a wave? Now, radio waves are really simple, right? I can listen to Andrew on the radio because those radio waves transmit to me. I can home in on that frequency, and I can listen to him while he's on the radio. What if I could do that with your brain waves? What if I could work out what frequency your brain waves actually communicate at and home in on that? Then I could read your mind. Hmm. OK, anybody scared yet? All right. Leave me alone with science, and I'll read your mind. So obviously, that's I'm using science slightly for evil. But what I've been able to do <laughs> is create this silicon chip. And on this silicon chip, which I can hold in my hand, I'm able to grow brain cells. And I can tell the brain cells exactly where they need to grow. And I can control them so they grow in a grid. And what we have underneath the silicon chip where the brain cells are is microelectronics. And what we can do with those microelectronics is we can work out how these brain cells are talking to each other. Now, sometimes we have to be like the Avengers and work in a team. So I don't do this by myself. I have a great team of researchers who work with me. I've got to mention Charles Onsworth, Katha Simpson, and Scott Graham, who are also part of this project, and a whole team of scientists who do this. But what we've been able to do is create this lab on a chip where we can work out how brain cells talk to each other. By doing that, we can tell whether they need to be in direct contact with each other or whether or not they have this frequency that we can home in on and actually be able to read people's minds. All right, so that's the evil side. For good, we're actually looking at Alzheimer's patients and people who have strokes and understanding patients who have lost that connection and how can we actually fix it um, when we've lost it in this chip. So brain cell on a chip, pretty cool. Final superpower. As much as I would love to be invisible, I'm talking about an invisible force field. OK, so if I'm actually not invisible, but I can protect myself from the outside world with the force field, that would be pretty cool. Nature already does this. If you put a drop of water on a lotus leaf, you'll find that it rolls off. That's pretty technical. No, it's not at all. It's a thing called superhydrophobicity. Long word, makes me sound smart, not technical at all. The lotus leaf actually has little nanoparticles on the surface. And these nanoparticles cause the water to form a wetting angle of 150 degrees or greater. So I'm like, well, nature's already done this. Why am I going to reinvent the wheel? I'm just going to change the surface roughness of something and put it so it's like the lotus leaf. So I can take a surface which has water on it, and I can add some little bumps to it. When I add those bumps to it, the water will still stick. And then what I can do is add some nano bumps on top of that, and those nano bumps, just like the lotus leaf, are what make the water roll off because this contact angle suddenly becomes more than 150 degrees. And you're like, that's pretty cool. What's cooler is a group of researchers who are in Pennsylvania who have developed these particles with the nanoparticles on top and put it in a can. You can spray yourself with an invisible force field. Yeah, and I have, and I know you can't see it, but I am fully protected. That's the great thing about working in nanotech. Nobody can prove you wrong, because it's invisible. <laughs> so I know that obviously as a superhero, I'm going to have my kryptonite, the one thing that makes me weak. Everybody has their own. Mine is chocolate. Whenever I'm around chocolate, I have no power. I can't help it. But it's OK, because I am protected. And let me show you how protected I am. I'm going to take my arch nemesis, chocolate. But it's all right, because I, as a superhero, have an invisible coating. And I am going to take my invisible coating 
and I'm going to see what happens when I pour chocolate on myself. And you should be able to see that with my invisible coating, <laughs> I'm fully protected. <laughs> so, what I'd like you to take away from today is that the world of science and science fiction, not that far apart. Number two, follow your dreams, no matter how crazy they sound, because people might laugh at you, but you can work at it and you can get there. And number three, it's still okay as a grown-up to wear a cape and jump off really high things. Thank you.